Uh, one of our great resources is whenever we don't know where to find something, we say, let's call Elio <laughs> in the way of seed. But uh, we have had a, uh, a great relationship working with Albert Lee Seed House, and Elia has been a tremendous resource to us of information, finding things, figuring things out, uh, the whole range. And I, I think uh, you're much too modest when it comes to what you know about growing crops. Well, thank you, boss. All right. Well, yeah, that being said, uh, when they asked me to speak here, I, uh, I asked what the topic was, and they said, okay, specialty grains. And the first thing that came to my mind is, oh gosh, now I'm gonna have to call Kloss and have a three hour conversation with him. Um, and, and then they told me I was presenting with Kloss. So um, basically, I'm gonna provide the framework here um, and let uh, Kloss uh, carry the ball from there because really, um, He's got, he's, he's a wealth of knowledge on all these subjects. Um, so we'll run through uh, a long list of specialty grains, some of which there's markets for, many of which there, there's not. Um, and uh, I slapped this presentation together um, rather quickly and I thought this quote was appropriate for a couple reasons. A, I stole most of this PowerPoint from other people's PowerPoints. Um, and B, there's not a whole lot of people in this room, uh, class amongst them, that don't think for themselves. Uh, so I think we're, uh, it's a really engaged and uh, intelligent audience here. And I would like to open this up as much as possible so that it's as, uh, more of a conversation and less of a presentation because uh, the information you guys have on any of these crops is uh, just as value, valuable as any information we have. So um, that being said, uh, we'll get started here. This is kind of a, an overview of uh, what we're, what we're going to cover here, and it's a lot, so we might not get through it all. So if something on here really jumps out at you guys, we can bounce around this. Uh, like Klaus said, um, this can be more of a web of knowledge as opposed to a linear um, trudging through uh, a PowerPoint. Um, so, you know, we start off with some fairly common ones like oats and barley. Um, but as Klaus pointed out to me last night, uh, depending on how you're marketing these things, uh, you can turn a, a crop like oats into a specialty crop if you're going for a specialty market with them. Um, P, you know, the other interesting thing is we'll focus quite a bit on winter grains because I think that adds a lot of value to a rotation and opens up a lot of interesting rotation, uh, crop rotations. Um, peas, hybrid winter rye is, is one of the things we're um, really excited about at the seed house. Um, and then uh, ancient grains, which is um, something I've seen more of on Kloss's farm than um, all the other farms I've ever been on in my life. Uh, uh, perennial wheat and perennial rye, millets, hemp, and if we don't get to it, that's okay, because again, uh, soybeans for, for human consumption is not necessarily uh, the most special of the special crops up here. Um, so again, any questions throughout, please just uh, holler them out. Um, so I'll just spend a, a little bit of time uh, talking about the fact that you guys are all in a specialty market, right? Uh, organic is, is a special market, and um, it's, uh, it's a place where uh, we've been happy to hang our hat as a business, and we're very optimistic about the growth. I'm sure you guys have all seen this chart before, but the, um, the amount of growth that we've seen uh, in the organic industry across the board is really phenomenal, um, and it really feels like going forward, there's a lot of potential for it to continue indefinitely, because one of the largest uh, consumer groups of organic commodities um, are people that are just kind of coming into their spending power. Um, and so as, those, as, that, as that millennial group matures um, and uh, they represent a larger portion of the market, um, I'm very optimistic about the future of organic. Um, you guys are in kind of a sweet spot. Uh, Wisconsin is one of the highest. This is a map of uh, acres of organic nationally and um, right here in Wisconsin. You guys are fairly well represented, um, north of 300,000. So 
again, uh, you're right in uh, the meat and potatoes of, of a pretty interesting specialty market. Um, Non-GMO um, is another market um, that uh, really, you know, corn and beans is, is the primary uh, driving force there and we probably, we might not get to it, but I just thought it was worth showing. Um, that's a pretty phenomenal growth trend there uh, from something that didn't exist in 2008 uh, eight years later to have over uh, 18 billion dollars worth of uh, sales um, is taking note and I think it's the same type of consumer that's consuming uh, non-gmo products as consuming organic products or just the fact that people are putting more thought into what they're picking up off the shelves um, is going to open the door for more and more of these specialty markets. Um, so here we started. Here come the rip-off slides. Here uh, I promise we'll get to the specialty grains pretty quickly here. Um, but I just thought it was interesting. Grain Millers is one of the largest uh, purchasers of um, grains in the and certainly oats at least in the United States, uh, maybe North America. Um, and they just invested in uh, uh, two million bushels worth of storage in northern Iowa. Um, so I think oats uh, there's. That, that can be exciting. And it, it also gives them the ability to store more than just oats. They don't just mill oats there, uh, but that's primarily what they mill. Uh, but they obviously see making an investment in the upper Midwest is good business. Um, this is another Jesse slide that I don't get any words on. So um, uh, I think the point of this is that they the specialty markets are very small. So it's slowly populating here. 66% of the stuff they mill in St. Ansgar is oats. And as this list goes down and you get to barley and spelt and, and other things, um, ah, thank you, Mark. That's probably, there you go. <laughs> um, so as you get to these other things, you can see what a small percentage, when you start talking about specialty markets, um, it is a very small percentage of things outside of, you know, organic oats that you're going to be able to haul and consistently sell um, without finding your own markets, uh, like an artisan brewer or something. So, again, just kind of food for thought going into the conversation. This is encouraging. This is another Jesse slide here. This shows where they've been sourcing their oats. So if you look at that map, you're kind of looking at Canada and the northern United States there, and the dark green represents where the oats are coming from. So back in 2008, 2009, you can see almost all of the oats that Grain Millers was milling there in Iowa is coming out of Canada. And uh, you can see that slowly shifting south and east, right into your neighborhood. Um, so I think this is another encouraging slide where I feel like people are trying to source things domestically more and I feel like there's some pull through from the companies that are buying them. They want to source domestically produced grains, um, which again uh, puts you guys in a good position. Sure. Why is it Wisconsin green? What's up with Wisconsin and Oaks? Well, uh, it's light green. It's light green in the last slide, right? So, I mean, it's coming. It's coming up a little bit. I mean, the, the the issue is the further east you go, and and you guys maybe can speak to maybe Klaus can start speaking at this point. Um, is you get into more and more disease issues. Right, so that's historically why the oat production has been from the north and the west. Now, uh, you, know, if you, you know, there have been intermittent supply problems with Canada, transportation problems from Canada. Um, so they're starting to weigh those considerations against the fact that they've got to pick through lots a lot more carefully from your neighborhood than they do from Saskatchewan. Yeah, you can maybe use up your own small grains better. Yep. Anyone here uh, grow oats and have trouble with rust? 
those uh, we found that every variety we grew last summer was infested with rust and oats rust can take a crop out i think with climate change we're being stressed a lot harder with some of these fungal diseases there was a outbreak of uh, wheat uh, stem or stripe rust in ontario canada this year they've never had a problem with rust there before so i, I think uh, it's another reason to have diversity but genetic diversity too you know when you have oat rust hit late it takes the test weight out and that of course then you still have the feed market but it sure cuts into the profitability but i think that uh, we've not really invested in oat breeding you know this public breeding is something that the our federal government used to take pretty seriously and our universities had a tremendous investment in but this is an area where the public good is not being served by the tremendous cutback in these public breeding programs especially in small grains because we need to maintain diversity and we really need to with the changing climate uh, update our genetics uh, what we're finding is there's an noxious invasive in oats that is really closely tied to rust and that's buckthorn you all recognize that weed uh, buckthorn looks like plums or cherries you know they're bushes what's that we have a terrible problem with it okay so you have a big problem with it it's an even bigger problem when you realize what it does biologically uh, normally the new races of rust will blow up in the with the wind when it comes from the south but in buckthorn these uh, rust organisms go through a sexual phase of reproduction which means that they diversify and they vary and they defeat our resistance a lot faster because of having buckthorn and i've done some selections for rust resistance in some of our oat varieties and the way i do it is plant the oats next to a buckthorn hedgerow buckthorn is also the winter host for soybean aphids. yes that, that's uh, the comment was that it also hosts soybean aphids so we have two major crops that are being adversely impacted by the presence of this noxious invasive weed somebody thought it was a pretty ornamental uh, i don't know what they were thinking but it sure isn't pretty when you see it in the hedgerow, especially not when you see what it does to the neighboring crops. It's also uh, very destructive to woodlands. It's an invasive. That's what's destroyed a lot of woodlands in this process. Okay, the comment is that the buckthorn has also done a lot of damage to woodland uh, ecosystems, actually, by, uh, by growing. So is there anything good about it? I, I can tell you the fruit is so bitter that it'll turn your face inside out if you try to eat it. <laughs> and there has been somewhat of a campaign to eradicate it throughout the Upper Midwest, hasn't there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, tr we're trying. We're trying. That's uh, once once the uh, the cat's out of the bag. So this is uh, these are just a couple slides again from Grain Millers. This is just a snapshot in time. But I thought it was interesting again just to point out that you are in a specialty market right now going from conventional pricing to organic pricing where the difference in pretty much every commodity from one slide to the next is almost double in some time in some cases uh where it's really depressed on the uh conventional side um like in barley uh, like this is grain millers. grain millers. Yeah, this is just grain millers. And again, it's a snapshot in time. I'm not saying that this is that exactly, but I was more, again, this is more just to kind of highlight that commo organic commodities, I get it. They're down. Uh, they're, they're not as high as, as, as we would like to see them. But relative, uh, you are absolutely growing a value-added commodity. And the oats price, even for feed, is way up because of the rust. So there should be a bump in your local oats price. Uh huh. And rye too. I mean, rye because of all the cover crop rye that's getting planted. I mean, conventional rye is like 450 right now. Um, so you're seeing a bump on both sides of that with some of these uh, alternate uses for these grains. So you might want to talk about what's available now genetically because we shouldn't be growing any of our old varieties of oats. So yeah, that's spring. right. Yeah, that's what we're not getting to right now. And this is kind of exciting. This is this is an exciting area. Um, because five years ago, we were really concerned about the state of oats in the upper Midwest. So much so that my boss, Mac, was flying out to Washington to lobby 
for the continued support of public breeding programs. Um, and uh, we, we are seeing a little bit of an uptick in public breeding programs uh, in our neighborhood, which is invaluable. Um, and the other interesting thing is they're taking note of organic. People are starting to specifically breed for organic systems, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, so this is a new oat we, and um, I'm not saying this oats for everybody, but I just thought I would highlight this one. The Sumo Oats is a new release out of South Dakota. And the interesting thing was this was specifically bred with organic farmers in mind. Um, as, as Klaus pointed out, rust, stem rust and crown rust is about paramount to everything else. Um, but this oat was specifically bred so that it would uh, sustain an, uh, an underseeding better um, and that uh, you know it had the test weight and the things that you're looking for. Uh, it's not as good of disease resistance as we'd like to see, but uh, it certainly was in the forefront of the breeder's mind as they're bringing this oat forward. Um, they've, they've got you in mind as an audience. You mean under seeding, you're talking about clovers? Yeah, clovers or, or yeah, your clover, you know, generally I'm, or alfalfa, but you know, that would be more on the conventional side as well. But um, since you guys are growing your own nitrogen sources, um, then you almost are always going to have something underneath that uh, small grain crop. And then if you want to talk about the disease a little bit. Yeah, you probably all know. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, you probably all know what rust looks like in oats. It kind of covers your machine when it's uh, making those red spores. But it's uh, it's unbelievable that a disease can take down a health, what's otherwise a healthy looking plant as fast as this one does. And I think it's really risky right now. And I don't know what's going on. It seems like this rust resistance is breaking down so fast. You know, when I was uh, when I was younger, uh, you'd get a new race of rust every five, four or five years, and you'd have varieties that lasted. But literally, every variety in the Cornell variety trial this year, except one, tanked. Uh, it's going to be a huge loss to our seed improvement because they had all the foundation seed lined up thinking that we were going to have roughly the same varieties. And I, uh, I talked to the people there and I said, you know, it's irresponsible to even put this stuff out for seed because you're exposing farmers to uh, basically crop failures uh, if we don't change our varieties right now. So uh, we're really fortunate Albert Lee took the step. You have how many varieties now? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people. It was a combined effort, certainly. And the take home message with this and with all these small grains is if you get that, there goes your specialty market, right? Because there goes your quality, there goes your test weight. Um, so keeping your keeping diseases out of your grains is paramount to su success if you're going into one of these specialty food type markets. I'm personally suspecting that high CO2 level might have something to do with this. Not, not that I've got data or evidence for it, but when I was in high school, we had about 276 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, today it's about 410. You know, that's almost what we used to figure an enhanced CO2 in a greenhouse was. And yet that's, you know, that's a very different environment. Uh, there's, there was lots of research uh, data back, I remember coming out in the 80s and 90s that said insects feed more heavily at higher CO2. Uh, a lot of our disease, a lot of our pests act differently and become more destructive. And that was experimentally. Of course, now we're living that experiment. So, you know, I think this this might be just the tip of the iceberg as to some of the challenges that we need breeding for. Go ahead, Mark. Is there any help with polycrops like peas or mustard, added milk? <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Good. Did, did you to repeat the question? Is there is there any benefit to adding multiple species uh, like a legume in with your oats? Um, for resistance to things like pest or disease. Klaus, do you want to talk to that? Well, we've, we've worked with mixtures for some time and actually there's a lot of research that shows if the harvest is not an issue, that if you've planted half of a field to one species and half of the field to another one, your total yield is going to be less than if you mixed them and planted them together, for, providing of course they're compatible. Uh, the big issue has been when we use herbicides that that didn't work very well. 
Uh, the other big issue is that unless you can sell the mixture, you have to have a way of separating it. Now, both of those are relatively easy to solve, especially in light of the possible economic advantage. For instance, if you had a mixture of peas and oats and the oats tanked because of rust, you'd have a pea crop. You know, it wouldn't be nearly the loss. So I, I think that's probably one approach to resilience. So have you done peas and oats? I, I've, the question is, have I done it? Yes, I've done peas and oats. And the big thing I've gotten out of that is I don't have near the weeds. I very seldom have weeds in my peas if, the, if they're peas and oats mixed together. And they do better together than separate. Yes, the, the, the total yield would be better than if I had them separate. And peas, actually, they're, they're a very compatible combination because in the combine, the oats cushions the peas so that you don't get the damage from the harvest. But you do have to have that extra step after harvest to separate them. Uh, yeah, the screening process, I know they're relatively easy to screen if you have a rotary screen. I think that's one tool if we're doing specialty grains that every farm, and, and even for corn and soybeans, every farmer ought to have a way to clean or at least scalp, give a rough cleaning of our grains. There's really no reason to store weeds and gar garbage it in with the crop. moisture to the bin too. I mean, you're putting a lot of moisture in your bin that way too if you put the weeds in yeah. there and that and then um i was just talking to mark about this last night if you if you put weeds in the bin with a crop um that can really affect how that how that crop stores in the bin um okay so moving on here so uh barley is another place where we've seen some a bright spot here where there's been an uptick in breeding work and it seems like you're one of the groups that's getting focused on here um, and there's also been uh, some work done on winter winter barleys as well, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, the variety I couldn't think of was Endeavor. Okay, okay. Thanks. Are you familiar with Kevin Smith's program there? Uh, so this is the, yeah, this, this is this is the University of Minnesota um, barley breeder, Kevin Smith, and he is currently um, working on both winter and spring barley varieties as we speak, uh, which is pretty <laughs> exciting um, and kind of highlighted the important things in red there. Uh, this is kind of his mission statement from the, his website. And uh, really, the things that are important um, from, from your perspective, um, and uh, luckily for, from his as well, uh, is the malting traits, um, as well as the disease resistance. Because um, if you get head blight, then nobody's gonna buy your barley. Most of these winter grains, yeah, have quite a lot of art and history and how do you grow them, you know, and what conditions uh, they like. The cultural practices are kind of specific. In general, uh, winter barley needs to be planted the earliest of all the winter grains, except maybe uh, rye can be planted almost any time. It can be planted early or relatively late. But uh, the Cornell recommends, and I'm gonna pick, instead of just bragging on our university, I'll pick on them for this. Uh, for years said to not plant winter barley any earlier than wheat. And I found if you do that the way it was recommended, you're giving up your top yield potential. Uh, you've actually guaranteed yourself a lower yield. And I asked one time, how come you've got this in your recommendations? And it was, uh, it was an issue over an insect and disease problem that occurs once in a great while. And I said, so why are you doing something that guarantees you a lower yield every year to avoid a problem that you might have one year in 10? Well, I, I never really got an answer on that, but barley does need to be planted early enough because it, it essentially sets its yield potential in the fall. And I think this is really important as we, if we look at these different winter grains, uh, wheat can produce good quality on either spring or fall tillers, but maybe I need to back up. Are you all familiar with what tillers are in the in your winter grains? Okay, so the main stem comes, and then if the plant grows under good conditions and has time in the fall, it will start producing side shoots that are tillers. Each mature tiller is able to produce a head, which will have grain in it. And uh, what I've noticed is that the highest quality and highest yielding heads are the ones that form in the fall with barley. 
And that's important because if we plant the barley later and we get a lot of spring tillers, we're actually reducing our yield potential. And also the uh, winter barley is somewhat winter sensitive, but I found having a big enough fall growth kind of acts as an insulation against the desiccation. You know, it protects against the wind. You can have that outer, those outer leaves pretty well burned off, but they're protecting the inner leaves and helping them through the winter. Uh, the exception there is if you get too much growth, you can get a situation called snow mold, and that's a, that'll actually kill spots in the field if they're, where they're too, too big or too soft growth. Now, wheat can produce either on fall or spring tillers, but what I found is barley has to be planted earliest, and wheat would be second, so that when we plant in the fall, we're first putting in our barley, then we put in our wheat, and then we go to spelt. And triticale has a wider range. Triticale has, is quite adaptive. But what we found with our spelt, if any of you grow spelt, is if we plant it early, it'll look like a million bucks. Oh, it looks beautiful. And I, I've done it many times and drove by and said, wow, we're gonna have 200 bushel breaker spelt and then uh, go put the combine in it and have trouble hitting 70. And this has to do with allocation of resources. So the, the growth that comes in the fall is growth that comes during very short days. And there is an, inter, there is an interaction where the day length triggers certain physiological functions in the plant. So the uh, spelt that grows during the short days will have a very high percentage of uh, straw, leaves, biomass, and a very low percentage of grain. You know, it's a low harvest index. And the, what grows during the long days of the spring actually produces a higher percentage of grain, but also higher quality grain. So it's allocating more resources into the grain. We can take advantage of that. A really dramatic example of that is oats. Anyone here ever planted forage oats? So what makes a forage oat different from a grain oat? And I learned this the hard way. I planted forage oats in the fall and it didn't amount to much. Our forage oats are short day oats. They produce a higher allocation of uh, resources into grain and less into uh, plant leaves and stems when they're uh, planted in the fall during the, long, during the short days. Our spring oats are long day oats. So if you, uh, and so that makes more energy going into the heads and into the grain. If you plant a spring oats in June, it'll be much taller and look nicer than if it was planted in April when it's supposed to be. But you're, not, you're gonna be awful disappointed when you look in the combine bin from it because it's a very high percentage of, um, of just straw and leaves. And if you plant spring oats late in the fall as a cover, they act as a forage oat. So the one year when I put in some spring oats and some forage oats, I was looking for the forage oats to really make the biomass that fall. And they really didn't do much at all, but the spring oats grew like crazy and produced a huge amount of biomass. So that's a way that we can take advantage of these day lengths in or, uh, to direct our crop. Any questions? What's your window for planting the, the winter barley? So yeah, again, the question is, uh, what's the best planting day for winter barley? It depends where you are. And that's, that's one place where we need our universities to be doing trials and you know, to actually take the data. Where we are uh, today, I would say between the 10th, maybe the 15th of September in New York. Now we did that this year, we were on the late side and we still have two more growth than I considered ideal but you can sometimes get a, you know, an early fall. So we're kind of, it's a guessing game a little bit, but I, you know, for right now, I'd say 10th to the 15th of September. If this had been when I, 20 years ago, it would have been from the 1st to the 10th. We've had that much change in the growing season. Do you have information on that? Okay, two weeks earlier than wheat, which is exactly, I think that's exactly right. So you got it right and Cornell got it wrong. Uh, whatever the wheat recommendation is for your area throughout Wisconsin, barley two weeks earlier than wheat. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, 
Okay. Doing good here. Uh, so yeah, this is just another barley breeding program that's going on a little a little ways away at Oregon State University. Um, Pat Hayes has come up, who's kind of an all-star out there, and he's come up with um, uh, a uh, naked barley, which is kind of interesting, just like there are naked oats. I don't know if you guys ever heard of those. Buff, buff is the old variety, Paul, Paulus oats. No? <clears throat> a little bit? All right. Um, so yeah, again, very uh, a very specialty market with a you know a lot of potential upside, um, and we'll just have to see where it goes. Um, They're using that in Europe, uh, the naked barley, because they get it produces the fastest rate of gain on hogs okay. of any grain they've ever tested. And that, so it's rate of grain on what? Uh, the the naked barley produces the fastest rate of gain on hog finishing. That the, of any grain that they can buy, including corn. So that's. So now, now we're not getting into the interesting barley's. We've got there's a quite a number of uh, winter barley's on the horizon that look like they're hardier than the things that have been getting marketed up to this point. Uh, Lima grain's got a couple varieties, Violetta and Calypso. Uh, both of these look hardier. Um, this. Uh, this graphic was uh, stolen from their website, and it was kind of interesting. This came up in conversation too. How, um, for some reason, Illinois and Wisconsin can well. Illinois is is kind of in the in the adapted zone, and Wisconsin's on the edge of it. But you go over one state to the west, and Iowa is is uh, is left out, as is Minnesota. So again, I don't think we're there yet. Um, but I think there's some things on the horizon that maybe we will have some winter barleys better suited for your neighborhood. Uh, do you have a Farm Brewing Act in Wisconsin? I don't believe so. I okay, the one so that's in yeah, New York and several other states now have Farm Brewing and Farm Distilling Acts where if you set up a brewery that uses local ingredients, it exempts those businesses from uh, many of the state taxes. So it, it's a tremendous advantage. Uh, and it, it really produces an artisan product. You know, we, we kind of made demand last night for uh, barley. But <laughs> <laughs> and they get their own label too, right? I mean, so, yeah. so pull through from the consumer side yes. where if, if, if you're using New York origin grains in your product, there's a New York origin label right. that goes right on the food shelf and again, that creates the pull through from the consumer side of things. And when you look at shifting markets, there's a, uh, one of the big areas of interest with our millennials and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the uh, emerging generation of customers is that they want artisan drinks. Uh, the Farm Distilling Act in our state has uh, sparked, I think there are three distilleries uh, believe it or not, we're sending five tons a week to Kings County Distillery of corn. And I calculated that back to uh, the amount of whiskey it amounts to. Uh, that's just to do the quick math, uh, five tons is what, about 180 bushels? I don't know. You get two and a half uh, gallons of pure alcohol out of a bushel. So if you just said 200 bushels times two and a half, That'd be 500 gallons, and you'd take that times three for the amount of whiskey. So there's 1,500 gallons of whiskey going down the hatch in Kings County down in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not cheap whiskey. <laughs> they can afford it there. They and can afford it. One of our friends, actually, with a, uh, the, one of the farmers I mentioned that helped us go to organic, now has an on-farm distiller distillery. And he's won awards all over the place, and he can't make the whiskey as fast as what his customers want it. So probably this is an area that's not saturated. Yeah, and and I actually had some rye whiskey a couple weeks ago from that was Minnesota origin, and I have to say it was it was quite good. Um, so both these past barley's, uh, the the interesting thing about these is these are two rows, and as as Klaus will tell you, malters really want two row barley. Uh, that some some of them won't even look at six row barley, uh, the artisan ones. Uh, SB one fifty one is a barley we produced in Wisconsin last year um, with R and G Miller. So that's kind of central South Wisconsin. Very close to here. 
very close to here. And they got it to winter. Um, it was spotty on the hillsides, as you would expect. Um, but uh, again, there's some optimism that there are maybe some better varieties uh, that are more winter hardy, um, although I still wouldn't hang my hat on them year in, year out. So one uh, advantage barley gives you, and even if you're not growing malting barley, that you could even have this advantage more. If you take it off a little early, you've got time to grow a crop of soybeans or dry beans, or BMR sorghum sedan, or any one of a, probably a dozen other specialty crops as a second crop in those fields. And what we've noticed is when we grow beans after barley, we have no weeds. Uh, it really does a good job of putting the weed seed bank out of commission for a little while. And that's an opportunity to add to the income. Double cropping is certainly cheaper than buying more land. And are there any drawbacks? What's the drawbacks to malting barley besides winter kill? Uh, that's the main one because you can always sell malting barley. Uh, so, are there any drawbacks besides, besides winter kill? Besides winter kill, yeah, uh, you can always sell it for animal feed. Uh, some of the malting barleys are earlier. Yeah, I was hoping I had a picture of uh, ergot or uh, head blight here. So the draw the drawback is if you don't make the grade, it, you know, because if you get a disease, if you get a if you get a rust or a disease in the head of the barley then uh, pretty quickly you're out of the malting market. Um, just like if you get disease in your oats, pretty quickly you're out of the milling market. Um, so it's the, same kind of, uh, it's the same kind of risk you're running there. And as Klaus said, you should always have a backup plan. Um, luckily, again, you're kind of in a place where you can sell uh, commodities for feed. You know, Cashin's right over here. Um, uh, so there, there are people that are buying this stuff for feed. You're not going to get the premium for it, but you've got a backup plan where some areas of the country, um, they don't, they're, they're, they're not that lucky. Well, is your feed mill the backup plan for you? <laughs> yeah, the question is, is our feed mill my backup plan? Yes, and it's the backup plan for virtually every other farmer in New York. <laughs> Another question? You just mentioned uh, planting beans after barley, is that soybeans after winter or spring barley? Uh, the question is if it's winter or spring barley. This uh, We plant uh, either soybeans or edible dry beans, especially pinot beans, after winter barley. The spring barley is not harvested quite early enough, but the winter barley is harvested so early that you've got much of the growing season left after it comes off, which is a tremendous opportunity, both in terms of the weed control that you advantage you get and making much more extensive use of your growing season. Another question? Do you till that or do you no-till? Would you venture to no-till into that stuff? Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to no-till for soybeans. Uh, for Our pinot beans have to be pulled. Uh, the varieties that do best with late planting uh, of pinot beans, need, we have to have that hill, but we plow very shallow and it's not a very, it's not a serious disturbance. It does push us kind of late uh, in terms of harvest, but I've had as much as a ton to the acre grow. I've even had, uh, this, this is an outlier, but I've had as much as a ton of dark red kidneys planted after barley if, it, if we can get it in really early. Is moisture availability a perennial problem at that time of year? Uh, moisture availability is a perennial problem, but with barley, it's starting to turn in early June. So even in the, the wicked drought of 2016, which for us, nobody had ever seen anything that approached that drought, there was moisture in the barley land, and there was enough moisture to grow a really nice crop of dry beans because the barley had stopped using water and was keeping the sun and the wind off the ground through that period of June when everything else parched. So that when the barley was harvested, uh, we had soil that still retained moisture. That, that was a huge advantage. The question is, when did we harvest? Uh, we harvested, I think it was the last day of June. If we would, were not taking it for malting, we would harvest it earlier and dry. We could probably cheat and get another, you know, maybe get it by the last week in June some years, you know, be a few days earlier which is not that far out of our soybean window. It's just the dry beans are worth more. What we found is that uh, among dry beans, black beans need to have hot nights when they pollinate. Uh, pinot beans really yield better if they, if they pollinate during cool nights. So that we're kind of targeting the type of bean for the condition. Can we cross seed mustard into that barley? Will that work and then go to the dry beans? Uh, the question is if we could cross seed mustard into the barley 
Uh, I don't know if that would, I've never tried it, and the mustard might get a little, it might mature just about the same time as the barley, which unless you were harvesting it for seed and selling it to Elia, you know, might not be the, the most desirable situation. Uh, what we found is when mustard, mustard will uh, start setting seed, if it's not terminated very quickly, it starts uh, resembling having a bunch of cut up barbed wire out there as far as trying to get rid of it. You know, when it's green, it just, it melts. But within a matter of days of being in that condition, it becomes so hard and fibrous that it's hard to manage. Good, we better start moving along so we get to some of the interesting grains here. Uh, spring peas are another nice thing to consider in the rotation. Uh, they're an up and coming protein source, especially in animal feed, I think. And there's a number of varieties of green and yellow peas out there that are very good. We've always produced DS Admiral um, and we've had good luck with them. Uh, winter peas are, again, kind of the home run, just like winter barley is the home run. Um, if you could get a winter, uh, a winter legume grain into the rotation, I think that would be pretty exciting. Um, as of now, we can't do it, uh, but he can for some reason. So, <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got to get you to try a little, few different methods. What we found is that uh, these peas, I don't, and I think winter grains are the same story. I don't believe they're dying from cold. I think what's killing them is desiccation. So that when you get a cold wind and the soil is frozen, they're losing water faster than the plant can replace it. And when we've had the, the winter peas in with the winter grain, it's given them just enough protection. And I've had a field that was split between uh, straight winter peas and then having the winter grain with it. And it's as different as day and night. We had like an 80% kill on the straight winter peas and absolutely no damage where there was a mixture. So that, that's pretty dramatic. Uh, there's a variety of winter peas I've heard about that doesn't have the tannins. The Austrian winter peas you could feed to pigs. Pigs love them. And they're actually a natural parasiticide because the, they're extremely high in tannins. But uh, if you don't, if you've got animals that don't like tannins, it wouldn't work. Now the the winter peas that are yellow would actually could actually be used just like spring peas, like the admirals. Yeah, and that's a great point. These are both white flowering winter peas I've got up here, uh, which make great forage. Um, they're not really great grain varieties for the reason yeah. that Klaus just mentioned. There are some more winter hardy ones on the horizon. Um, Icicle is one we're trying this year. Uh, another one that I've been talking to a grower about in South Dakota, who's he's gotten it to winter the last couple winters, is one out of Wyoming State called uh, WYO. So again, there's some stuff on the horizon, maybe a good fit, maybe not a good fit. I think Kloss is combining them with the small grain, uh, you know, uh, you're going to get more growth out of the small yeah. grain in the fall. It's going to hold snow. It maybe opens up, um, you know, so that, that might be really the, the management of them might be a bigger thing than the, the variety. But we are always on the lookout for hardy winter Isn't peas. There one called Wyndham that's about, they say it's five to ten degrees colder than Austria? Wyndham. I'm not familiar with that one, but well, I would, be there, a, there might be. Northern Ohio. Okay. Have you heard of that one? I, I haven't heard of that one, but the, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are. Cover crop seeds are. Sure. There, there are varieties. There's a lot of breeding going on that we don't know about. They say it's about 10 degrees different. Five, five okay. degrees Fahrenheit different okay. than Austrian. But I've had the Austrian winter peas survive 14 below with no snow on the ground. Yeah, one of the things that I, I tried Wyndham, I still didn't get Wyndham to work. <laughs> uh, but so when there's a breeding program, a USDA breeding program out of Washington, you heard Leia talk about how we planted the peas so deep last fall, not this past fall, but in 2016. And, and the, I'm curious if you heard this. The, the pea breeder said if you plant them really deep, that that enhances winter hardiness. Now, up to three inches. Um, and what we had, we, we didn't get a chance, we were trying to put them in a rotation, we didn't get a chance to put them in so that the soil temperature cooled down right away. Yeah. But I don't know if you I'm skeptical. I guess I'm kind of skeptical because you still have the same wind issue, unless maybe the crown stays below ground. But I think having a small grain next to it will, might accomplish the same thing. 
you know, of, of giving that protection. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't think that's crazy for a spring pea at all. That depth, um, peas need a longer period of um, exposure to moisture to germinate. So they need a lot, they've got a longer period that, and that's one of the reasons people say to plant them real early and deep in the spring. Now, winter peas are smaller seeded than yeah. spring peas. So that might be one of the things you're running into, but I'm just guessing on that. So here's an idea for a crazy uh, winter crop. And you can have your cover crop and eat it too. That's I'm actually stealing that line from Mary Hall. But uh, these Austrian winter peas produce pea shoots in May, the tendril and the ends, and they are absolutely delicious. They taste better than any other salad green there is. And if you can get connected to a high-end restaurant, uh, they are worth a lot of money. I've uh, first heard about it from a friend in New England, Aero Rutella, who had uh, Hmong people working in his fields and they kept asking him why he was plowing under this valuable vegetable. And he, after a year or two, started having them harvest the tendrils, and they were selling ten to $15,000 a year worth of pea shoots without losing any of the benefit of having the cover crop off those pea fields. But we've gone a step further with our friend Dan Barber down by New York City. He claims that having these winter vegetables mixed gives better flavor. So when we plant our rye for roll down, we're now putting the uh, tillage radish in with them. And those long daikon radishes are really delicious for restaurants and you can pick them as late as into December. And we've tried having some uh, turnips and the turnip greens would, be, would survive into some pretty cold frost. And now we're talking about what else could go in there. We could be putting kale in. So you could put a whole range of vegetables that need absolutely no hand weeding and have a market for winter vegetables to restaurants. And when you're all done, you've still got a crop that you can terminate with a roller and rotate so that everything you take off it is gravy. Yeah. And yeah, Kloss is blessed with a very big market in proximity to his farm. So he's got he's got access to a consumer group that we maybe don't, although uh, some of you guys are probably close enough to Chicago to tap into that that type of market. And of course, BS is not just a fertilizer, it's a selling tool. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now uh, we'll move on to rye, something that we're <laughs> pretty excited about at the Seed House, um, and um, something that we've been we're, you know, we've we made a commitment um, a couple years ago that we really wanted to see more rye, especially on conventional acres, quite frankly. Um, but organic acres would be nice too. Um, and we've we actually just recently committed fifty thousand dollars to the University of Minnesota um, for a rye evaluation program, which is pretty exciting to have one right in our backyard. Um, and we're also co-sponsoring some feeding projects with Pat. Practical Farmers of Iowa. If you could get uh, rye into a hog ration, um, it would be a game changer. And they're doing it in Europe very successfully. Uh, I didn't really go into that part of the rye, um, but uh, let's suffice it to say there's some opportunity there. Um, and the other KWL as, is also sponsoring another feeding program through Purdue um, for feeding rye to pigs. Um, so uh, at the risk of using up our time, uh, there's really some important agronomics about rye. Uh, for instance, most of our winter grains are self-pollinated. Rye is an open pollinated plant like corn. And like, for instance, the variety Danko um, is an open pollinated variety. So that every year you keep your seed back, you lose a little bit of yield from the previous year. And for two or three generations, it can be pretty good but it'll cross pollinate. So if you have another variety of rye near it, you could actually spoil it in just one year. And the hybrid rye ha is hyper fertile. Now rye is also self infertile. So that if a, an unfertilized rye flower will form ergot very easily. And if you just have a single head of rye out in the middle of the field, it'll generally be barren because it doesn't pollinate itself very well. It's actually more self incompatible than corn. And one of the ways that the hybrid rye has pushed yields up is the same thing as, the, as our hybrid corn. It makes it uniform, but it also makes it hyper fertile so that you end up with heads with 100 grains in them, as opposed to an open pollinated, might, you might be lucky to get 30 or 40. 
Absolutely. So, uh, so the pollen produced. So, what we're talking about now is hybrid rye. Um, so that's what that's what this is going to be focused on, um, because it's pretty. It's a pretty exciting development. Just like hybrid field corn was uh, was a game changer, um, hybrid rye can really be a game changer too. And this this graph, what this indicates is the amount of pollen given off um, the hybrid varieties as opposed to the open pollinated varieties, which is exactly what Klaus was just talking about. It not only gives you more yield potential, but it also excludes pathogens. So you get less, you get less of the ergot, which again is going to take you out of a lot of markets pretty quickly. So it's got to do, it's got, it's doing, it's working really hard for you two ways. And this pollen is, that's, it's a big, it's a big part of the equation. Yeah, the, the difference is really as striking as hybrid corn versus open pollinated corn. And there are some open pollinated rye varieties that come pretty close. And the new version of Danko is called Dankowski. And it yields, I think, within 5% of some of the old hybrids. But if you keep seed back, it, that yield breaks down so rapidly that it's... Uh, yeah, it'll yeah. Stray, from, stray from variety. Um, so yeah, these uh, these the, the all the all the pol rye pollen in the fields uh, again just kind of excludes the things that you don't want in your seed head. And I don't know if anyone uh, knows what ergot is. Do you know what the downside is? Um, ergot produces a metabolite which is very similar to LSD, and it can actually in high concentrations cause abortion in cows. So it, it's really nothing to mess so, with. Yeah, the take home message, even if it's fun for humans, it's not good for cows, so people don't like it. <laughs> and it is believed that the Salem witch trials happened after a really wet summer when they had a lot of rye that didn't yep. uh, set well. Yep. Moldy rye bear, I doubt that that's a real thing. Yeah. Um, uh, they, you know, rye as a crop is pretty cool. You can see the root mass difference between it and wheat. Um, and now Klaus has talked a little bit about this. I'll let him talk about the tiller. So this is another thing that hybrid rye does better is these tillers that makes yield right there. Yeah, and the tillering, each one of those fall tillers, and rye will also set on spring tillers, but each one of them can make a full seed head. And I've, I know the hybrid rye can make 100 seeds in a full seed head, and they have very large kernels. So the yield potential is unbelievable. Uh, we had an intern from the east of Germany that's an area where the soil is very sandy, very droughty, and it doesn't rain much. Uh, you don't picture that in Europe because most of Europe is damp, but those internal regions, some of them are extremely dry. And when we were harvesting rye, I remember him commenting, he said, well, you guys don't know a thing about rye in this country, do you? And, and I was all ears. And he went through several rules for rye. And he said in, in Germany on conventional farms, 200 bushel is normal, that if you're below 200 bushel, you've fallen down on some management factor. So uh, this, this is a crop that is really is a game changer because corn in a severe drought is not going to do 200 bushel. Do the math on it. I mean, if you're getting four and a half bushels conventionally, you're getting four and a half bushels and getting 150 bushels of rye, or you're getting 200 bushels of corn and getting two bucks a bushel for it with half the inputs, and you've got something growing there all year long, taking care of all your erosion, all your fertility issues, running down the tile line. I mean, it's, but, but you need something to do with it, right? So you gotta be able to sell it somewhere and, and cover crops aren't gonna take care of all of it. So we gotta get it in feed rations. And that's why the feeding trials. So right, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the difference in the seeding rates on the hybrids? Yeah, the seeding rate on Ryan, actually on all small grains, we've gotta, we've gotta get away from the bushels per acre seeding rates. There is research in Europe and I think I'm hoping that we might do this here in the United States a little better where they know what end stand density they want in any region for the optimum yield. Now my friends in uh, Canada are telling me that for, they believe that we should be somewhere near 550 heads per square meter for, for optimum yield and they say when you figure your seeding rate you start from that and then work your way backward. And they, they actually have good solid data that from what the fertility is, what your planting date is, and several other factors to, and your location, that they can work backward from the desired optimum stand to give you a seeding rate. Then you take your seeds per pound 
and you arrive at what where you should start. And for early for very early planting dates in Europe, they have seeding rates as low as 50 pounds per acre, which makes the price of the hybrid seed really more more pretty modest. Really. More you can stomach it a little better. So yeah. who anybody plant rye for grain in the room? Okay, well, so what's your seeding rate? Uh, bushels per acre. We're, we're experimenting with two and a half. So two and a half bushels per acre. There's about roughly 900,000 seeds yeah. per bushel. Yeah. Um, so you're getting 18, 20, two, two point. Two point some million. Thank you. <laughs> two point some million. Um, if you can see up here. Uh, and the hybrid has smaller kernels that you're planting. Right. So you you so we're so they're saying eight hundred thousand. Uh, eight hundred thousand seeds per acre is gonna get you one hundred and fifty bushels of rye. So I and and now you, because of the tillering yeah. um, effect on the rye, I'm not saying drop your VNS rye down to fifty pounds an acre, um, but it's something to think about. They're also placing the seed a lot more carefully. You know, yeah. uh, their drills are a lot better, um, and the spacing's a lot better, and the depth control's a lot better. So there's some other factors in here, but the bottom line is I think we've been overseeding rye this whole time, unless you're rolling it down. And planting it too deep. Yeah, I haven't been, a lot, a lot of my decisions are driven by for whether I decide to keep it as a cover crop the next spring. Right, and I yeah. Need a grain crop, depending on whether yeah. I have Yeah, and you definitely want that, you and want, need that you need that density for the cover. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a rhyme to remember when you're planting rye, and it's translated from German. And that's rye wants to see the sky. You're better off having those seeds laying on top than having them too deep. Any time rye is more than three quarters of an inch deep, you're giving up yield potential. And that's really important. The other thing is you don't want an uneven seeding rate. You know, if we're planting 800,000 seeds per acre, it makes a big difference if they're yeah. uniformly spaced. Yeah, absolutely. If they're in little piles, they're actually fighting each other. When you've got two rye kernels laying beside each other, it's reducing the early growth, which determines these seed heads. So that if we could singulate, and there, there is British research where they planted equidistantly, I think a foot apart, and we're able to make over 100 bushels. I mean, that, that's a ridiculously low seeding rate, but because they were uniformly spaced, they were able to make more yield than we do. So these, these really uneven stands, are they really undercut us. Spacing and depth, under an inch. Okay. Yeah, this fall, I'm one of the fields we're experimenting, we're, cr we're cross-seeding reducing the seeding rate in and then checkering it. Cross seeding and it's a tremendous stand. It's, it's a market difference mm -hmm. from, from trying to throw that much reduce seed. That, so, reduce uh, that rye, rye competition. If you got, you know, largely have 200 in their fields a different day. Uh, the other thing they do is that the, their agronomists, when they plant, will take stand counts and they can tell you whether you're on track to make, just like you do with corn, they can tell you, are you on track to make your yield? And unlike with corn, they could tell you to strategically put on 20 units of N. If, if they see you're behind, you don't have enough tillers, and there's still some growing season left, they will prescribe a small dose of N to increase the tillers and speed up. And they actually say you're better off being on the short side of your goal because it's much easier to bump it up. There's a few things you can do to slow it down. And if you're too thick, you have standability issues and uh, grain size issues at harvest. So we are at time, and we only scratched the surface, but you definitely covered some pretty important small grains. We have a 15 minute break, so if the audience wanted and wanted to do a quick transition, uh, there will be a transition or a certification session in the other room next, but it, this, is, this is a time we're supposed to break. I'll leave it up to the audience. I said I can see. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a hard stop at 3 30, though. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, if anything, we'll leave you with it. You will leave you with this, and maybe open it up to questions on the rest of the crops. Uh, this is the University of Minnesota data on rye, and the hybrids yield 50 to 60 percent more than the the highest yielding grain varieties. That's the take home message here. So that, it's it's a step change. Um. So yeah. Now, questions. There was a question here. I, I just I wanted to know. If you you all had any insight on industrial hemp? <laughs> yeah, I thought that might come up. <laughs> 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 um, 
It's I, more fun than moldy bread. Now, now, you actually planted some as a cover crop, didn't you? Yes, we planted some last year. Our biggest issue with industrial hemp is the attorney general and the attitude that the government has. Uh, they have schizophrenia because our state governments are supporting it and the federal government says don't do it. But uh, with, with proper licensing and making sure your paperwork is in order, there is potential. And Canada has a thriving industry growing hemp seed. They have, uh, they're actually able to get almost organic prices out of conventional hemp because they just don't have enough organic hemp seed in, that, in their markets. Uh, I'm meeting with a man from Denmark in two weeks who is producing 2,000 acres in Europe and he wants to set up in production in the United States and contract with American farmers. Uh, he has certain varieties that he wants because his company produces not just hemp seed, but also CBD oil. Uh, there's quite a lot that goes into uh, producing it. Uh, the worst thing is harvest. And let, let me picture something, paint a picture for you. How many of you have a rotary combine? Uh, have you ever heard of hemp rope? Uh, if you cut the, the hemp at the ground level and uh, put it through that rotor, picture a rope hanging out the end of your combine. <laughs> and hemp rope is really strong. So uh, it takes, you really, really just want to cut the heads. In the Netherlands, there is a special market. Mercedes is buying hemp fiber to produce the interiors of their cars. And Mo Model A Fords were actually uh, that black material that looked like plastic on the old Model A Fords was hemp. It was still legal to grow in the United States at that time. So there, there is a market for that. Now, the, if you're producing it for fiber, they use a little different varieties and they have to harvest it while it's still green. What they're doing in the Netherlands and in uh, Belgium, as far as I know, for fiber is that they've got a machine that uh, is fabulously expensive, but that the company owns. So the farmers contract and then they have the harvester come in that will cut the heads off. And they're uh, sort of like high moisture corn. And they're actually fermenting that for cow feed. And then they take the stems and they're bringing it into the plant and water retting it. And it makes a fiber. Uh, hemp fiber makes clothes that are virtually indestructible. And it's, some of the cloth that I've seen is, is really beautiful. So I could see this, uh, if it were economically possible, companies like Wrangler, and I've, I've actually talked to a buyer from Wrangler Jeans who says that their, their customers are asking them, how sustainable is cotton fiber? Well, there's nothing much more destructive on the environment than growing cotton in terms of the chemicals, the effect on the soil. There is a potential here for a game changer, but we're not there yet. Uh, there is no infrastructure in North America for making the fiber, and we don't know if it can be done competitively in price, but the potential is there. But there is uh, potential for the seed, and there's certainly a lot of interest. And CBD oils, uh, are anyone here familiar with what that is? So it's, it's a pharmaceutical, and it's shown to have impact. It's a strong painkiller. Uh, people with cancer are getting relief from it. Uh, there's evidence that it will uh, uh, help ameliorate the symptoms of Parkinson's and that it, it has other uh, beneficial health effects. And this company in Denmark who I'm talking with is called Enoka, E-N-O-C-A. If you want to look up their website, you can see some of their products. But they have, uh, they came almost overnight there and have turned into a many million dollar a year company, probably tens of millions of dollars a year selling these pharmaceuticals that are being widely accepted. So the potential is enormous. But what's more exciting about hemp is the old uh, Adamaha weed book or manuscript that I quoted in the keynote talked about hemp as one of the best cleaning crops that you can put into a rotation. Uh, one of the cultural practices that I didn't mention is that deep shade puts the weed seed bank into deep dormancy for the following year. And Adam have observed that if you grow hemp, you get such a total sunlight interception from these big plants with the leaves that you have a greatly reduced weed pressure the following year. Uh, it's also got a, a very aggressive root system. 
It's from a completely different plant family than most of our crops, and that it's a soil builder that tends to aggregate soils and uh, leave the soils in much richer condition than it started. A question? I got a pasture that we put winter cattle on. It actually went from a thistle cycle to literally a thistle cycle. Okay. Yeah. Last year it was solid wildcat, so now it'll be interesting to see what, what that cycle will be for this year. So you, the comment is that you had a field where a little bit of hemp turned into solid hemp. Hopefully that's fixing whatever issue that soil has. And before that, it was solid thistle. And hopefully it's displacing the thistle too. Right. right. You know. And it sounds like that would make sense. If the thistle worked its way out of a job, then the hemp is still continuing to reduce your compaction because it makes the tap roots. You know, and it, and it granulates soils. It gives off a lot of, it's a mycorrhizal plant. It gives off a lot of exudates. So it, it's a, it could be a very beneficial part of a healthy farming system. Well, you might have a, you might be able to wildcraft hemp seed, but you would have to have a license or you'd be committing a felony. <laughs> oh, another, I mean, it's not a problem, but the issue of marketing the medicinal product of cannabis, it seems like it's going to be captured by mainly uh, corporations, larger entities. What I see in California, the places that have legalized it, it would seem like it would be much better to and advantageous to help support beginning and young farmers if organic owned the medicinal cannabis industry and we treated it like the tobacco used to with allotments and uh, government-sanctioned auctions so that the product would be, the benefits would be spread around. So the comment was that it really would make more sense to allow the medicinal development be, some, be a way for young farmers and I assume smaller farmers to be growing a crop. It'd be nice if it had allotments. I, I, I agree with your comment. Uh, the, I think our government has the ability to stay irrational much, much longer than we have given it credit for. <laughs> so the fact that that makes sense might make it less likely. <laughs> uh, the question is varieties for pea milk. I assume what we're talking about is something like soy milk. So the, to make pea milk, you would not want tannins, but I would guess the yellow peas would be. I would be, guess it'd be the same thing for the food, but I don't know. So that if, if you could get some yellow peas, I think they would probably be the ones that made the best pea milk, just because you would not have a color issue, and you certainly wouldn't want tannin in your milk. Although uh, noth there's nothing pigs are more excited about than very high tannin winter peas. It sounds like they're eating gravel. You don't even have to grind them and they actually are a natural wormer because they, the tannins are just like what's in walnut hulls. <laughs> <laughs>